Will you open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 10? And I want you to try, as we turn there, to imagine Corinth. So Corinth was uh, a particularly godless city in the first century. The Greek geographer Strabo wrote of Corinth in around 20 AD. The temple of Aphrodite was once so rich that it had acquired more than a thousand prostitutes, donated by both men and women to the service of the goddess. And because of them, the city used to be jam-packed and became wealthy. The ship captains would spend fortunes there. And so the proverb says, the voyage to Corinth isn't to just any man. So high on the hills, on one of the hills of Corinth, was a great temple, the temple to Epaphrodite, the Greek goddess of love. And the Apostle Paul, in writing to the believers here, is quick to draw their attention through inspiration in verse 7 of 1 Corinthians chapter 10 to say, Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. Now that word idolaters is only used on seven occasions uh, in the Greek. And it's interesting to note that it's used exclusively in Corinthians, Ephesians and in Revelation. The, the references are on the screen there for us. We, we don't intend to go through them all. It's just interesting to note, though, that this problem of idolatry was a major issue we can see in Corinth, as it was in Ephesus. This morning, I think you've been considering Diana of the Ephesians. So we're not surprised to know that idolatry was such a problem in the city of Ephesus. A major, major problem, though, in the, problem in the city of Corinth. And we don't intend to turn to all these references, we just won't have the time in our morning session. But the other two references are in Revelation 21 and 22, where we read that idolaters are without. They're not able to enter in to the city of the great king. They will not be in the kingdom. And so no wonder the Apostle Paul exhorts them, whatever you do, don't be idolaters, as were some of them, as it's written. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Now you'll know that those verses are taken from Exodus chapter 32. So should we turn back to Exodus? And we see in Exodus chapter 32, Moses in the mountain. And it's critical for us to understand that he has been going up and down the mountain. And Exodus chapter 32 is actually the fifth time that he's in the Mount Sinai. And during our chapter, he's going to come down. But the, the ascents and descents of Sinai, as that slide is helpfully showing to us, have been uh, sometime before. In Exodus chapter 19 it started. I'd just like us to go back to Exodus chapter 20. Because in Exodus chapter 20, Moses gives to the children of Israel the Ten Commandments. Now, he hasn't been given yet the stone tablets with the Ten Commandments on. That's actually in our chapter, in chapter 32. But he's been given them orally, and so when he comes down, uh, we read in chapter 20 that he is going to give to the children of Israel the Ten Commandments. And the first one, verse 3, is you shall have no other gods before me. We then read that uh, in verse 22, that the Lord said to Moses, Thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, Ye have seen that I have talked with you from heaven, you shall not make with me gods of silver, neither shall you make gods of gold. So Moses said to the people, whatever we do, commandment number one, make no other gods before me, is what Yahweh has told us. 
And we've also been told we cannot make gods of silver and gods of gold. And what's also interesting for us to note in verse 26 of chapter 20, neither shall you go up by steps to mine altar, that your nakedness be not discovered thereon. Now, the, the point here is relevant to us, as we shall see when we get to chapter 32, that the people were told you're not allowed to make an altar and have steps going up to it. Think about the clothing that the children of Israel would be wearing. And as they would walk up steps, so their nakedness would be exposed. And God is saying, no, I am holy. You're not allowed to do that, lest I see your nakedness. It's discovered thereon. And so when we come to chapter 24 of Exodus, we see Moses being invited up again into the mountain. For the fourth time, we read in verse 1, he said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, thou and Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and worship ye afar off. Now I'm sure that as soon as we read that phrase, our minds have jumped, haven't they, to Ephesians chapter 2. So you might want to make a note in your margin of Ephesians 2, 14, or Ephesians 2, verse 17. Because we notice, don't we, that the law cannot bring the people nigh to God. Even though Moses, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, the 70 elders, they've been brought up into the mountain. Then still afar off. And we read in verse 2, Moses alone shall come near. So we're just given, aren't we, a shadow of what the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be able to do that the law is unable to do. And so Moses comes down the mountain, verse 3. Then we read in verse 9, I've got in my margin next to verse 9, 5 up. So for the fifth time now, Moses is going up. And we read that he went up with Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel, and there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of a sapphire stone, and as it were, the, very, uh, the, the body of heaven in his clearness. And upon the nobles of the children of Israel he laid not his hand. Also they saw God, and did eat and drink. Now, I want us to just note this phrase, that as Moses Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel come up the mountain. They are able to see God. They're in his presence. They're with the angels. And they did eat and drink. Now I'm sure many of you are already connecting Exodus chapter 32. We'll turn there shortly, but you might just want to note in your margin Exodus 32, 6 next to the phrase, eat and drink. Because these men are being given this great privilege in the mountain of eating and drinking with the God of Israel. And we read in verse 12 that Yahweh said to Moses, come up to me into the mountain, be there, and I will give you there tables of stone and a law and commandments which I've written that you may teach them and Moses rose up and his minister Joshua and Moses went up into the mount of God and he said to the elders tarry ye here for us until we come again to you and behold Aaron and her are with you if any man hath any matters to do let him come to them and so Moses and his minister, his servant Joshua, are taken higher into the mountain because they were still afar off. And so you've got to try to imagine that, as it were, they're on base camp, that most of the people are there in the plain below. But Moses, Aaron and, and, and her, the 70 elders, Nadab and Abihu, have come up the mountain and they sit now, they camp in base camp on the mountain. And there they've been able to share a meal, to eat and to drink with the God of Israel. 
and Moses is taken higher into the mountain. We read in verse 18 that Moses went into the midst of the cloud and got him up into the mount. And Moses was in the mount 40 days and 40 nights. And in that time, things start to go badly wrong in the valley below. Come to chapter 32. We read in verse 1 that when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said to him, Up, make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what is become of him. Now, we're just interested in the first instance in this word delayed. When the people saw that Moses delayed, that Hebrew word is used on 109 different occasions in Scripture. And this is the only time it's translated delayed. Most of the time, it's translated as ashamed or shamed. So I'm going to suggest to you, it's up for discussion, I'm going to suggest to you that really what that phrase is saying is that when the people saw or the people perceived, their impression was they perceived that Moses was ashamed, they went up to Moses. Moses hadn't been delayed. He had been in the mountain a long time, much longer than any previous time. He'd been up there for 40 days. But it wasn't a delay on Moses' part, far from it. But the people, perhaps we might suggest, in the plain below, think, well, this Moses, he's ashamed of us. He's too embarrassed. He's brought us all the way from Egypt out into this wilderness. We're going to die here. He's too embarrassed to come back. I wonder that that is the sense of what it is that we're reading. And what we note is that these people gather themselves together unto Aaron. Now think about that. Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, her, the 70 elders of Israel, have been told very clearly by Moses, tarry here until I come. You stay on the mountain. Stay on base camp until I come to you again. And the people in the plain below, starting to believe that Moses is ashamed, as he's delayed his coming, send representatives up into the mountain. We read that the people gather themselves together unto Aaron. They head up the mountain. And they say to Aaron, Up, make us gods, which shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what has become of him. And Aaron said to them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons and of your daughters, and bring them to me. And all the people break off the golden earrings which are in their ears and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand and fashioned with it a graving with a graving tool. After he had made it, a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Israel. So Aaron makes this molten calf. Now, interestingly, I think, within the law of Moses, within the first five books, the only other occasion that we come across this Hebrew word calf is in Leviticus chapter 9. So we have it in Exodus 32. We also have it in Deuteronomy. But both of them, in Exodus 32 and Deuteronomy, are referring to the molten calf. The only other time we come across this word in the law is in Leviticus chapter 9. So just keep a marker here and come to Leviticus chapter 9.
In Leviticus chapter 9, we see that Aaron is taking centre stage on the narrative. And he's specifically told to take a calf for a sin offering. We read in verse no, verse uh, 8, just verse 2 for, to start with, just because we come across that word calf there, that Moses said to Aaron, take thee a young calf for a sin offering, a ram for a burnt offering without blemish, and offer them before the Lord. And then verse 8 to read, Aaron therefore went unto the altar and slew the calf of the sin offering, which was for himself. So we'd like to make a suggestion that perhaps Moses, Moses, under inspiration from God, has given to Aaron a very specific sin offering. That he is to take a calf which was to be for himself. And so God in his divine wisdom has prepared an offering for Aaron that it might be a reminder specifically for him, a test in times to come. And so we come now to Exodus chapter 32. And we see in Exodus chapter 32 that what should have been, perhaps, this test for Aaron on the first hurdle, as it were, he fails. Because of all things, he makes a molten calf. Aaron, remember your sin offering. Remember, too, the commandments given by Yahweh, from Moses, from Yahweh, by Moses, about what you must not do. You must not have any gods before me. You must not make gods of gold. We shall see later. You must not have steps that we see your nakedness. And so Aaron here, with great folly, fails. But we're just interested to note that Aaron, in making this terrible, terrible mistake, I would suggest to you is, in this mistake, trying to bring the people still to Yahweh. Just look carefully at what we see. It's the people that say, up, make us gods. Aaron then says to bring the gold, and the people bring their gold. Aaron makes it, and they said, look at the end of verse 4, they said, these be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation, said, tomorrow, It's going to be a feast to Yahweh. He's just made a god of gold, a calf. And they rose up early on the morrow, and they offered burnt offerings, and they brought peace offerings. But the people sat down to eat and to drink, and rose up to play. Now, brethren and sisters, I think there's a major lesson for us here in our ecclesial lives and family lives today. We're seeing within the brotherhood brethren pushing the gods of Egypt. We're seeing people pushing ideas and agendas that are entirely at odds with Scripture. We're seeing people try to merge the gods of Egypt with the God of Israel. And what Aaron is doing here is trying to compromise. Do you see? That as he's made this molten God, 
which we shall see is one of the gods of Egypt, in trying to pull the situation back, in trying not to lose people, he says, tomorrow's going to be a feast for Yahweh. Hold on to Yahweh. What are we like in ecclesial life? Are we strong enough to say, evolution does not belong in the brotherhood. Theistic evolution, it's an oxymoron. Those things are not compatible. Let's be very clear. As a brotherhood, where we stand, we do not compromise. We do not allow the gods of Egypt into our ecclesias. If we do so, we're no different from Aaron, who in this terrible instance tries to merge the thinking of the people with Yahweh. It's a great lesson, brethren and sisters, for us to learn. And so we know, don't we, that he made this molten calf. And this calf is a throwback, is it not? It's a throwback to the gods of Egypt, to the goddess Hathor. And just look what we read on the screen there. Hathor is an ancient Egyptian goddess usually depicted as a woman with the head of a cow, ears of a cow, or simply in cow form. She was the primordial mother goddess, a ruler of the sky, the sun, the moon, agriculture, fertility, the east, the west, moisture, and childbirth. Further, she was associated with joy, music, love, motherhood, dance, and drunkenness. Brethren and sisters, this is why when the Apostle Paul was inspired to write to the Corinthians, he says, Neither be ye idolaters. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and to drink. Look, verse 6. And rose up to play. He's seeing in Corinth men and women caught up with worshipping the goddess of love, Epaphrodite. And he draws their attention back to Exodus chapter 32. He says, look what happened to them in the wilderness journey when they tried to compromise, when they went to their ecclesia, but they were all too caught up with the gods of Egypt. He says, you can't do that. You can't go visiting the temple on the hill. You can't go getting caught up with Epaphrodite and then think it's all right to waltz in here on a Sunday morning and break bread. What are we like? What do we do Monday to Saturday? How caught up with we are we with the gods of Egypt, with the gods of Corinth? Brethren and sisters, we need to stay well clear of the thinking of the world. And so we note that Moses comes down the mountain after his 40 days in the mount. Verse 15, he turned and went down from the mountain. The two tables, the testimony were in his hand. The tables were written on both their sides. On the one side, on the other were they written. And the tables were the work of God. The writing was the writing of God, graven upon the tables. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, there's a noise of war in the camp. And he said, It is not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither it's the voice of them that cry for being overcome, but the noise of them that sing do I hear. Where has Moses grown up? Joshua, in the land of Goshen, has perhaps been unaware. Moses grew up for 40 years in the heart of Egypt. He knew the sounds of music and dancing to the goddess Hathor. And as he comes down the mountain, and in his distress, he gets to base camp, and the tents are empty. 
I told um, her, Nadab, Abihu, the 70 others, Joshua, did not I say to them, stay here, tarry here till I come? The tents are empty. They've gone. And what we can hear now, no doubt he's telling Joshua as they come down the mountain, prepare yourself, prepare yourself. You're going to see something altogether terrible. And it came to pass, verse 19, as soon as he came nigh to the camp, that he saw the calf and the dancing. And Moses' anger waxed hot. And he cast the table out of his hands and brake them beneath the mountain. He took the calf which they had made and burnt it in the fire and ground it to powder and stored it upon the water and made the children of Israel to drink of it. And Moses said to Aaron, What did this people unto thee that thou hast brought so great a sin upon them? And Aaron said, Let not the anger of my Lord wax hot. You knew the people that they're set on mischief. For they said to me, Make us gods which shall go before us. For us, for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what's become of him. And I said to them, Whosoever has any gold, let him break it off. And they gave it me, and I cast it in the fire, and there came out this calf. It reminds me a bit of what my brother and I might have been like when caught for doing something as children. It may be hard to imagine, but uh, on occasions we were naughty. Uh, <laughs> alas, alas. We'd all be too quick to say, well, you know, Dad, you know, what happened was, you see, this happened, and then so-and-so did this, and, and then literally, you know, we turned away, and, you know, suddenly, there it was, and, you know, we didn't mean to, Dad, but this is just how it happened. We're not so different, are we? And we need to learn a lesson, don't we, here? That all of us, on occasions, get things badly wrong in our lives. We can make terrible mistakes where we so foolishly put the gods of this world before the God of Israel. But what we need to do is be prepared to confess our sins. Not make up some stupid story. The God of all the earth knows our minds. He knows our thinking. What are we like? we need to ensure that we're prepared to confess our sins before him. And he will forgive us and allow us to move on in our wilderness journey. And when Moses, verse 25, saw that the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked, unto their shame among their enemies. Now we're just interested to see, look at this word naked. We find it in Proverbs 29, verse 18. I just want you to turn there, if you would. Keep a marker again here. And come to Proverbs 29, verse 18. Now this verse, I've quoted in every job interview I've ever been to. When they talk about, they ask some question about leadership or vision, this is where we go. And we say there's a proverb. Proverbs 29, 18. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Now that word perish is the same Hebrew word as our word naked in Exodus 32, verse 25. So if you don't already have a note there, we need a note to connect those two verses. Where there is no vision, the people are made naked. The people perish. You'll see that the authorised version margin has the phrase, is made naked. But he that keeps the law, happy is he. And so, brethren and sisters, what has happened in the valley below is that the people have lost their vision. And so we ask ourselves... How strong is our vision on our wilderness journey? If we don't have a strong vision of the kingdom, of the promised land that we're heading to, we can find ourselves caught up, being made naked, casting off restraint, 
as the people are here in their wilderness journey. We need to have a vision of the kingdom. And so I'm going to give you a challenge, if that's all right. Or if it's not all right. And the challenge is this. I want us to really try this week to build our kingdom vision. I asked the young people in the, the, the teenager session first thing this morning to call out different things that they're looking forward to in the kingdom. And they were able to give some lovely, lovely spiritual answers. Maybe you can ask them, talk to them. Let's talk to each other this week. What is it that we're looking forward to in the kingdom? And support each other in building up a vision that our end be nothing like the men and women here in the wilderness. So many who are destroyed by a plague because of what they do here. We need to ensure we've got a vision burning brightly of the promised land. Now, if you're not already in Exodus 32, again, just turn back. Because we also notice a connection to another verse in Revelation chapter 16. So, verse 25, we read that when Moses saw that the people were naked, Aaron had made them naked unto their shame. That the words naked and shame are picked up for us in Revelation chapter 16. We, we looked at this verse very briefly yesterday morning. Just quickly... Turn there. Revelation chapter 16, verse 15. And there's no verse in Scripture, brethren and sisters, that is more apt than for us because we know it's our time. In our exhortation yesterday, we thought, didn't we, about the different history periods in the book of Revelation. And this period, chapter 16, is us. The Euphrates is dried up. The Ottoman Empire has been dried up. The frog-like spirits have gone out. They're starting to come out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. We shall look more carefully tonight. The spirits are there, beginning to gather the kings of the world to the great day of God Almighty. To the great day of the battle of Armageddon. And in brackets, top tip, blessed, behold, I come as a thief, blessed is he that watches. What were they not doing? They had been told, tarry here until I come. We tarry, waiting for the Lord Jesus Christ to appear. We've been exhorted to watch. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Exodus chapter 32, verse 25, should be in our margins there. That is our end, brethren and sisters. We will be caught in those plagues. We will die in the wilderness. It will be our end. We will not go into the promised land unless we watch and we keep our garments in the days that remain. Come back to Exodus chapter 32. Or well, perhaps first come to Matthew 24. Let's come to Matthew 24. It's en route. Matthew 24. Just pick up this theme of watching. So we read in verse 36, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Now, we just need to be thinking, don't we? Comparing what we're reading here to Moses in the mountain. He's been sent right up into the mountain. Think about the analogy to the Lord Jesus Christ, who's gone high up into the mountain to be in the presence of God, as it were, and he's going to come back. Tarry here till I come. But as the days of Noah, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. 
For as in those days, before the flood, they were eating and drinking. What did we read in Exodus chapter 32? That the people got caught up in eating and drinking. Rising up to play. Of course, rising up to play has all sorts of sexual overtones related to the goddess Hathor. The reason the Apostle Paul refers to them is because of what's happening in, in the temple of Aphrodite. And here we read marrying and giving in marriage until the days that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Verse 42, watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord does come, but know this, that the good man of the house hath known in what watch the thief would come. He would have watched and would not have suffered the house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour ye think not the Son of Man comes. And so I think what we have here, brethren and sisters, is a contrast now, verse 45, between a faithful and wise servant. Now you will know that Moses in Scripture is the faithful servant. Of course, the Lord Jesus Christ is the faithful servant too. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his Lord has made ruler of his household to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he comes, shall find so doing. Verily I say to you, that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But, and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delays his coming. What did the people say? And shall begin to smite his fellow servants. What do they do? And to eat and drink with the drunken. That is, brethren and sisters, Exodus 32, 6. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looks not for him, and in an hour when he's not aware of. And shall cut him asunder, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And when we come back to Exodus chapter 32, that, brethren and sisters, is the picture that we see. Just come back there now. Exodus chapter 32. We see that because of what happens, there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. That Yahweh plagues the people because they had made the calf which Aaron had made. But what is rather lovely, and this is typical of the God of Israel, this is typical, brethren and sisters, of our God, that before that plague comes into the camp, they're given another opportunity. Verse 26. Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who? Yahweh! Me! Let him come near to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. Now, that phrase that we read, Who is on the Lord's side? In the Hebrew is three words. Who, Yahweh, me. And it's almost like a military commander. That's what I want you to try to picture in your mind. As Moses stands in the gate of the camp. And you've got a choice. You're either for the gods of Egypt. Or you're for Yahweh. And so the cry goes up, Who? Yahweh! Me! And so many stand with the gods of Egypt. But out of this tragic, tragic incident come the Levites. All the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. And he said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, put every man his sword by his side and go in and out from, the gate, from gate to gate, 
Throw out the camp and slay every man his brother and every man his companion and every man his neighbour. And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses. And there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. And Moses said, Consecrate yourselves today to Yahweh, even every man upon his son and upon his brother, that he may bestow upon you a blessing this day. And so we see the Levites emerging from this disastrous situation and standing up for the God of Israel. Brethren and sisters, where do we stand? Are we too caught up in our lives with Hathor, with Aphrodite, with the gods of this world? Or do we stand on the side of Yahweh? We need to ensure that we take ourselves, that we hold our children's hands, that we hold our grandchildren's hands, our nephews, our nieces, our uncles, our aunties, and we stand with Moses on the side of Yahweh. And so it's the Levites who now are going to war the warfare for God. Let's ensure in the days that remain before he who tarries comes, we are warring the warfare. We are acting like the Levites, doing the service of our God. We'd just like to finish, brethren and sisters, with two things. The first is what the key lessons must have been for the brethren and sisters living in Corinth. So just quickly come to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 to finish our thoughts. The Apostle Paul has been inspired, hasn't he, to take their minds back to that incident. Why? We thought already, obviously, some of the key reasons why. And we wonder that, in addition to those we've already thought about, Neither be ye idolaters, verse 7. Verse 14, wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men, judge ye what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being made of one bread and one body, we're all partakers of that one bread. Verse 20, I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. What did we start with? Moses, Aaron, Nadab and Abihu. Exodus 24, verse 11. They were brought up to base camp. They were brought up to the Mount of the Lord, and there they did eat and drink with the God of Israel. And just a few days, a few weeks later, they were eating and drinking with the gods of Egypt in Exodus 32 and verse 6. Brethren and sisters, we cannot serve God and mammon. The Corinthians had to learn, don't go near that temple. You can't have it both ways. You make a choice in your life. You're either for Yahweh or you're not. And so, just quickly, what are our lessons? Don't look back. We've left Egypt behind. Whatever you do, don't look back. Have a vision of the promised land. Stay on the mountain. Stay in the ecclesia. And watch until the Lord comes. And let's, let's make certain, in the days that do remain, until the Lord Jesus Christ shall appear, we stand on the side of Yahweh and we war the warfare for him.